As investors, we're always looking for the best companies in the world. We want to invest in what's the best. The best companies in the world, in many cases, make the best stocks to invest in. So in this video, I thought it would be good to discuss the best company in the world. The best company in the world is Tesla. All right, all right, I'm just kidding. Tesla's a great company, one of the best companies in the world, but Apple's obviously the best company in the world. You know what? I think I got you again. It's actually not Apple. It's not Facebook. I mean, come on. There's too much controversy surrounding Facebook. Is it Amazon? I think that gets close. Amazon is certainly one of the best companies in the world. It's not Amazon and it's not Palantir either. Even though this is a great company, it's not the best company in the world. The best company in the world is Costco. It really is. And in this episode, I'm going to be explaining why. You're probably not expecting me to say Costco is the best company in the world amongst all these tech giants that dominate the market. We have Tesla, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia, Facebook, and Costco's not even in the top 10. In fact, Costco isn't in the top 20 in terms of market cap. We have other bigger names like Alibaba, Pfizer, Adobe, Nike, Netflix, Disney, Salesforce, and then we get down to Costco with a $233 billion market cap. Costco may not be the biggest company in the world, but in my opinion, it's the best company in the world. So let's go ahead and go through this. We'll go through why Costco is the third largest individual position in my portfolio behind Apple and Microsoft. Why do I have so much money invested into this one company? Costco is a no frills, warehouse-based membership retail company. And to someone that hasn't studied this stock or really looked into it, the business looks unimpressive. It looks really not that unique, doesn't look like it possesses any type of incredible moat, and it doesn't look nearly as impressive as companies like Palantir or Tesla or Apple. But under the hood, Costco has an incredibly powerful business model and many unique benefits that I think rival that of big tech companies. The first and most important thing is to understand the actual basics of how Costco works. Unlike most retail businesses, if you think of retail like Target, Walmart, or Kroger's, you consider them to be companies that sell products. They are sellers, that's what they do. They sell products and they take a margin, that's their business. Costco is not in the business of being a seller. Costco doesn't just sell products. In fact, that's not even what they focus on. Costco considers themselves to be a buyer. They are a buying agent on behalf of their members. Their whole goal is to get the best value for their members. So Costco goes out and buys products. They curate products on behalf of their members and they pass any savings that they get from their massive size and scale, not onto the investor. They don't pass them on to you and me as investors. They pass them right along to the customers, to their members. At first glance, you might think this isn't a good investment. They're passing all the savings along to the members, not to the investors. While this does suppress temporary earnings of Costco, because all this margin is being passed along to the customer, it helps retain customers for years and years. It builds up enormous brand loyalty. Costco has become a place that people trust. They trust that they'll be taken care of as members at Costco. They can buy anything without any risk. If they have any trouble at all with any product, they can easily drop them off at the desk and say, I no longer want this product. And Costco will accept the return. Costco accepts returns for almost any reason. Even if it's your fault, they'll still accept the return. They've done this over the years and it's built up massive customer loyalty. The combination of incredibly consistent and good value, high quality curated products, a well-paid and friendly staff, and a top-notch customer service with an unbeatable return policy makes for long-term loyal members. Costco members have become cult-like. It's similar to companies like Apple and Starbucks. They really love this company. And the longer they do this, the longer it gains customer loyalty. So even though the massive savings that Costco gets from their size and scale is passed along to the customer, in the end, it will benefit the investor. Costco's not just a retailer, they are a platform. And you have to view this company as a platform. It's in the same vein as YouTube being a platform for do-it-yourself videos, for amateur productions. Netflix is a platform for professionally produced content. The Apple App Store is a platform for developers to create apps. Amazon is a platform for online retailers. Costco is a platform. Even though their warehouses aren't digital, they should be viewed as a platform because that's how they operate. And platforms in and of themselves have many benefits. Platforms don't have the challenge of product risk. By product risk, I mean they don't have a single product or service that can be disrupted or challenged by competitors. For instance, let's compare Costco to Tattoo Chef. Tattoo Chef is a product company. Tattoo Chef is a healthy and vegan take on food. 
This is very popular right now. Healthy food is in. If the trends ever shifted away from healthy foods, or if there's another competitor that created better designs or better tasting foods, Tattoo Chef could get hurt by that. They face many competitors with their same products. Platforms like Costco don't have to worry about competition in the same way as a product or service-based company. Costco doesn't care whether it's Tattoo Chef being sold, or Tyson Food, or Beyond Meat, or any of these companies. Whatever one is in style, whatever one's popular right now, can be swapped in in Costco's freezers. No matter what the trend is, no matter what the style is, no matter what food is being sold, or what product's popular, or what clothing's popular, Costco will outlast all of it. They don't care if it's Nike or Adidas. They don't care if it's the iPhone or the Android. They don't care if it's the Samsung TV or the LG. Costco can swap in and out products, whatever ones are popular at any given time. If any of those products don't sell well, they take them off their shelves. They don't renew them. So Costco doesn't have the same type of product specific risk. It is a platform and it benefits from being a platform. Now Costco doesn't just have the benefit of being a platform, it's also a membership based company. And membership based is kind of the retailer way of saying it is a subscription based company. Subscription based business models are often called the best business model. In fact, I personally think that subscription based models are the holy grail of business models. Whether or not you're talking about Apple increasing their service and subscription revenue, whether or not you're talking about Netflix or Amazon trying to grow their subscriptions with Amazon Prime, or Microsoft, where their entire business is based around subscription-based billing, it's clear to me that every winner, virtually all the biggest companies in the world, are subscription-based companies. And if they aren't right now, they want to be one. All of them are trying to grow subscription revenue because subscription revenue is the best type of revenue. Around 2012, Adobe started their transition from their business being a legacy one-time sales business to a subscription business. Once millions of people started to subscribe to their Adobe Creative Suite, their earnings went through the roof. This is the direct impact of highly predictable, high margin subscription revenue. Around 2014, Microsoft made the same transition. Look how flat the earnings were for the past five years before making this transition. Once they brought in Satya Nadella as a CEO and they made the transition to a fully subscription business, their earnings started to go through the roof. This is again, the power of highly resilient, low churn subscription revenue. Disney has seen the light and they wanna make the transition as well. They're in the process of doing that. I have full belief that if Disney is able to make this transition to having a huge portion of their revenue from subscriptions, that their business will be dramatically better in the end. We've seen this play out time and time again. With Disney Plus, Disney is repositioning their business as a subscription company. Warner Media is yet one more dinosaur legacy media company that's moving as quickly as possible to a subscription-based business. Every company that's able to will try to move to a subscriber-based model. Costco's already there. They're way ahead of these big tech companies. They've already beaten them at their own game. They were a subscription-based company before subscription-based companies were cool. Costco has grown their membership base or their subscriber base by millions and millions every single year for the past 20 years. The last data reported is that they have 111 million card holders. Now on top of having a growing membership base, they're also keeping their members. Costco retains over 90% of their memberships every single year. This is an incredibly low churn rate. It's very similar to Amazon Primes. Costco members are also billed annually, which is preferred it means you have the money up front, making your income more predictable, and the members are less likely to cancel. Microsoft actually announced that they're increasing the prices of just their monthly subscription to push more of their customers into the annual subscriptions. HBO Max wants you to switch your subscription from monthly to annual so bad that they're willing to give away free movie tickets for you to do it. Costco's already there. All their subscribers are already billed annually. So you'd be doing yourself a disservice to look at Costco's revenue and just compare it one-to-one -one with Target or Walmart or Home Depot. None of those companies are subscription-based companies primarily like Costco. They might have some parts of their company that are, but 100% of the people shopping in Costco are subscribers, and that provides incredibly resilient and predictable earnings. Another thing to consider with Costco is how they run their business and how they de-risk it for the investor. For example, Costco uses essentially no leverage in their business model. They have $7.5 billion of debt, so they do have debt. I guess that's leverage in a sense, 
but not really because they always carry more cash on hand. They currently have over $12 billion of cash. That means that they could safely pay off all their debt right now and have $4.6 billion left over. Having a net balance sheet of $4.6 billion de-risks this investment for the investor. You have essentially zero chance of this company going out of business anytime soon. This is inherently less risky than companies that have leverage. For example, if we compared Costco's balance sheet to Starbucks, right now Starbucks has $6.6 .6 billion in cash and $14 billion in debt. That's a net debt of $8 billion. They couldn't pay back their lenders right now with the cash they have on hand. Companies that carry excess debt are at more risk than companies that don't. This isn't by happen chance that Costco has more cash than debt. This is a deliberate decision. The management has made it clear that they will never employ leverage to try to speed up the growth of their company. They will never potentially jeopardize their business or put it in a distressed situation to try to speed up growth. It's not something that they need to do and they know they can grow this business organically, self-funded, without employing leverage. Now let's consider the fact of how fast Costco has grown without using any leverage. This is incredible in and of itself. As we've seen, the revenue has grown consistently, same with the subscriber growth. The EBITDA, which is a proxy for their earnings, has grown consistently over the past four years. Their net income has always been positive and continues to grow. And again, this is without using leverage, without putting the company at any risk. Their earnings growth is the most impressive. It's so resilient, it's so reliable, and it's fast growing. It grows much faster faster than most companies and faster than the rest of the S&P 500. For the past 20 years, they've had a 15% compound annual growth rate with their earnings. It's almost unheard of for a company to have that. And with that earnings growth, they have resilience. They have no dip during the 2000 dot-com bubble. They had a very minor dip during the worst recession we've ever had in 2008 and 2009. It quickly recovered in one year. Their earnings continue to grow with the rise of online retail and Amazon. Their earnings grew during the worst of the 2020 pandemic. Costco's EPS growth looks more similar to one of the big successful tech companies than it does a retailer. So even though Costco may not fit the typical definition of a growth stock, it's growing in every way conceivable. It's growing in its membership, its revenue, its EBITDA, free cash flow, it's growing its net income, and its earnings per share. The thing that it's not growing, at least that substantially, is its shares outstanding. In 2016, five years ago, the total share count was 439 million. So they had 439 outstanding, and last quarter they reported 441. That means that they have diluted the shareholder by a whopping 2 million shares over a five-year period. This is a minuscule amount of share dilution. In fact, it's almost negligible. Now, Costco is considered to be by many one of these more boring boomer companies. It's not an exciting tech company like Google or Microsoft or Palantir or Tesla. But let's go ahead and look at the returns overall, and we can compare Costco's return to the S&P 500 and even the QQQ, the big tech index that holds all of those exciting companies. Now, over the past month, Costco's in the green, these are in the red, but that is a one month period. That doesn't mean much. Let's zoom out to the past six months. All right, Costco is up 39%, while the Invesco QQQ is up 14% and the S&P 500 is up 8%. So Costco has crushed the major indices over the past six months. Let's go back a trailing year. Okay, in the past year, Costco's up 42%, the QQQ is up 25%, and the S&P 500 is up 24%. So again, Costco is roughly almost doubling the returns of the major indices over the past year. Let's look at a bigger time horizon, the five years. This is where things get interesting. Over the past five years, tech companies have really boomed. I mean, they have had explosive growth. But even then, Costco is outperforming the QQQ. It has a 232% return compared to the QQQ's 223% return and the S&P 500's 100% return. Now, in addition to this, Costco is a big dividend payer. They pay out massive special dividends. So if we factor dividends into the returns, which are not being factored in here, Overall, Costco's returns would actually look quite a bit better. All right, so Costco has outperformed the QQQ and the S&P 500 over the past five days, the one month, the one year, and the five years. Let's go back even further. Let's look at some different timelines here. Let's go back 10 years. Over the past 10 years, since 2010, the Invesco QQQ has been on an insane run. It's beat almost every other index conceivable, but Costco still outperformed it and with less volatility. 
Now we can even go back further than this. Let's go back another 10 years. Let's start with 2002. In this case, Costco still outperforms the QQQ and the S&P 500. It's also outperformed with having better best years and less drawdowns, less volatility, and a better sharp ratio. Now this is all past performance. There's no guarantee that Costco will perform this well in the future, but so far this hasn't looked like a boring boomer company. It's looked more like a high growth company, giving investors incredibly good returns that have beaten even the QQQ QQ over almost any timeline. Now, of course, there's a lot of other things we could mention. Costco is a steady dividend payer. They've never missed a dividend payment, and they've issued these massive special dividends whenever they have excess cash beyond what's needed to safely grow their business. Costco is successful in literally every market that they try, whether it's Europe, Canada, Mexico, Japan, or even China. People across the world love Costco. They're opening up their second Chinese location after their first one was literally flooded with members. Costco treats their warehouse workers and their employees with Way better than most other retail companies like Amazon. The CEO of Costco, while talking to Congress, explained that not only is it the right thing to do to treat employees well, but it also works as a significant competitive advantage. At Costco, we know that paying employees good wages and providing affordable benefits makes sense for our business and constitute significant competitive advantage for us. It helps us long run by minimizing turnover, maximizing employee productivity, commitment, and loyalty. We encourage our employees to view Costco as providing a career rather than just a job. And as a result, our employees' retention rates are very high by retail standards. In the U.S., our employees average over nine years of service with the company. Over 60% of our U.S. employees have five or more years with Costco, and over one-third have more than 10 years. We're very proud of the fact that more than 12,000 of our U.S. employees have worked for the company for 25 years or more. Again, we feel the experience level and loyalty of our employees is a significant advantage for our company. So you might be saying, all right, Joseph, I get the point. Costco's a great company, but why is it better than Home Depot? Home Depot is a great company as well. They've been growing. Why isn't Home Depot the best company in the world? The first thing is Home Depot has no subscription revenue. So throw out that entire benefit of that SaaS-like annualized subscription revenue. Home Depot is also somewhat of a cyclical company. It is vulnerable to recessions. Look at the 2008 recession with Home Depot. Look at their earnings decline quarter after quarter, year after year. They had major decline in earnings. In fact, Home Depot in one quarter during 2009 earned only 19 cents. This was barely anything during this time period. Home Depot and Lowe's are not the type of companies you would want to own in a major recession. Home Depot and Lowe's are both leveraged, creating more risk for the investor. Home Depot has $5 billion in cash, $35 billion in debt, which is a net debt of $30 billion. This is an indebted company. Starbucks is another dividend growth investor's favorite, but they also, like Lowe's and Home Depot, have more debt than cash on hand with an $8 billion net debt. They also have no real subscription aspect to their company, so you don't have that highly reliable income. And Starbucks is also somewhat vulnerable to recession. They had a pretty rapid decline in their earnings during the 07 recession. They also had a huge drop in earnings in the 2020 pandemic. So although Starbucks has recovered really well, it's more of a product-driven company than it is a platform like Home Depot. This is the struggle I have with Costco in my portfolio. It's such an incredibly good company that anytime I'm trying to buy something else, I compare and contrast it against Costco, and I come back to thinking, I'd rather own more Costco. It's simply a better company. Whether I do that versus Home Depot, or versus Nike, or against Comcast. Comcast has a massive amount of debt, way more than they have cash. Their revenues aren't growing as fast as Costco's. Their earnings have been good overall, but they're far more sporadic and less predictable. And I don't think the product, Comcast Internet, is well-liked. At least it's not nearly as well-liked as Costco. The only thing that's stopping me from putting more of my money into Costco right now and really piling into this holding and making it a huge holding in my portfolio is the price. Costco has been bid up to a very high multiple. Right now, the Ford PE ratio of Costco is a 44.6. That is the Ford PE. The trailing PE is 46. This is incredible. This multiple for Costco is higher than companies like Apple or Google or even Microsoft. Investors right now are paying a higher multiple on earnings for Costco than Microsoft. That's incredible to me. So even as great as this company is, even though I believe it's better than all these other companies, I haven't piled into it as much as I'd like because the multiple is so incredibly high. If the price does trend down, 
and it comes down quite a bit to where the company has a more reasonable valuation, I will be buying a lot more of this company. But right now, the only thing that's keeping me out of it is valuation. There's a lot of companies to invest in, a lot of different options that you can choose, but every time I'm doing analysis on different companies, I continue to come back to the same names over and over again, and Costco is one of them. It's a little lower down on the list, it's not one of the top 10 companies, but in my opinion, in 10 years time, I only think this company is going to be moving up the list, because Costco is the best company in the world.